Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Ward, a doof media podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss Ward while those return to the world of parahumans. Half true. My name is Matt Freeman. True. And this is my co-host, Scott Daly. True. And we are very excited to bring you another episode of our show. Half true. This intro is going really well, Scott. Lie. This is the weekly podcast where Matt and I eagerly dive into Wild Bo's world of superhero stealth missions, crocodiles that don't look like crocodiles, and alien-based death powers as we analyze and interpret this ongoing web serial. This week on the show, we conclude, question mark, art 14 <laughs> breaking with chapters 14.12 and 14.z. First, Victoria and company initiate Operation Warren Armstrong, which brings them face to beak muzzle with Chris, a two-year-old in a monster's body, Eldman. Then we go into the head of the most empathetic, empathetic human in the world, Mr. Armstrong, as he beautifully wraps up all the themes of the arc in a nice Sveta shaped bow. Matt, what did you think of these two chapters? Um, they're fantastic. Great chapters. Um, the, you know, the teamwork of, of our heroes in the um, in the main arc chapter. Uh, the get to see some more Chris. We get some great dialogue involving Chris. And then, of course, we were introduced to Camille Armstrong, who, I'm going to be honest, I had a different impression of, of who he was, but as, as soon as we got to know him, I realized, no, this is the, this is the same Armstrong that we've come to know and love, and uh, it, was, it was awesome. Yeah, um, I, I, we don't know for sure, because we're recording this on a Monday night, so the Tuesday chapter has not come out. We normally record on Tuesdays, so we can pretend like we're surprised when we know uh, if it's a new arc or not, uh, this definitely felt like the end of the arc to me, right? There's a lot of stuff going on at the very end of these chapters that seems like it's it's wrapping up um, everything we've been talking about. And I think one of the things that these chapters, especially the Armstrong chapter does, is really just kind of wrap up the themes that that this arc has been dealing with. A lot of the, the questions that it's been asking, the things that our characters have been struggling with has really, really wrapped up in in uh, Camille Armstrong's interlude perfectly, like in a great way. Yeah, the character of Armstrong and the character of Crock of Shit actually are these fantastic like poles, like opposite poles of a magnet that sort of draw into stark relief a lot of the other things we've been talking about in, in this arc and in this story, of course. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And it's great. It's exciting. And I can't wait to talk about it. Cool. Let's get into it. All right. Uh, so I suppose first we have to make an announcement, which is that yeah. we are off next week. Um, yeah, the episode first. that would have come out next Wednesday, the 10th, uh, will not be there. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I'm out on vacation. It will be next. Uh, it will be seven. It will be July 17th is yeah. when the next uh, the next yeah. episode will be released. So basically, we'll just cover all the chapters released between 14.Z and that day. Um, yeah. So probably four maybe five chapters but uh sorry about that guys we uh, i'll be out of i almost said out of the country out of the out of the continent and yeah. uh and uh we can't we used to back in worm we used to pre-record stuff when, when one of us was on vacation but uh can't do that can't do so, that now yeah but, we didn't we didn't get the uh the chapters in advance yeah for some reason Wildbo didn't pre-write them for us it's, yeah it's disappointing but, but uh, yeah, we'll you know, be back and excited. I think this is going to work because this is a this is the end of an arc, probably, and um, so it'll be nice to kind of jump into an arc with a, a big meat of chapters. You know, right. four or five chapters. Four or five chapters, which is about what we were doing in in kind of a smaller. We've got worm episode, so yeah, yeah. should be doable. Should be doable. Yeah, maybe this one will only be three <laughs> three hours. Right. You know? No, no. All right, chapter fourteen dot twelve. And we pick up from the cliffhanger slash game changer at the end of 14.11 nah. with Victoria, Swansong, and Vista breaking through the prison wall. Victoria uses her Kenzie-powered 
map hacks to keep track of the enemies and then to also, of course, generally make the whole scene much more tense and exciting. Yeah, I really uh, I really enjoy this device, the Victoria map device that is uh, such a big part of this chapter. I think it allows Victoria to get an overall view of the facility. So we're kind of back to a a, a Taylor esque battle a map of the battlefield. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in a certain kind of way. Yeah. I mean, it works differently here because it's it's just cr- cranking up the level of um, of, oh, we're going to be caught tension. You know, yeah, that, yeah, because we can keep cutting back to we know exactly how far Chris is is from us. We know exactly how far Cole Belcher is. We know where the guards are. Um, right. A lot of like this is basically a stealth mission, right? Our characters right. are like trying to do this thing. And it's not just whether they succeed in the mission. It's whether they get spotted because they could save Armstrong and still be spotted and be screwed. Have, having just screwed over all of Earth Gimmel. Um, and so yeah, it's, it's this really kind of tense stealth mission. And the fact that Victoria can hack cameras makes it even more fun. But I, I think what I like about it the most is that there's a very understandable limitation to this thing, right? Like she can only see what the cameras see. So right. if a camera is not seeing anything, she can't see it. Um, so cryptid is flickering in and out of view. Guards are disappearing, going in places that she says uh, normally she would expect people to go for smoke breaks. But nobody on this planet seems to smoke um, that kind of thing. And, and yeah. I think that helps like amplify the tension too it's because like we know we were given more knowledge than we would normally have but still with an inherent limitation to it right because it gives you the sense that victoria is going to be relying on it and then suddenly somebody's going to pop around a corner that she wasn't expecting which basically does yeah. happen i mean i i think that Wildbo essentially takes 100 percent full advantage of this you know this story conceit that he's created where yeah it's cool to be able to see through the cameras but it's almost a double-edged sword because then you start to rely on that capability. Right. And she almost even says that herself um, when she's like, I have to pay more attention now because I know that the camera isn't seeing everything. You can't just like rest in the knowledge that, well, I have a camera that can see everything because actually it's like, well, there's, it's not, it's not a hundred percent reliable. Yeah. It's, it's really good at, at making this whole scene even more tense, I think. Right. Yeah. I mean, basically this is a very, I think, uh, on brand Wildbo thing to take some some neat idea and to make sure that he explores it from every angle um, quite efficiently too. You know, yeah. the, it's not like we spend a ton of time on this. It's just we we explore a bunch of different consequences of having this kind of tech, and it's it's very fun. It is. I like it. So speaking of things that are cool and fun, Vista is able to create pockets out of the walls to hide them from sight as needed. But even this trick is imperfect. Yeah, but really effective, though. Mm -hmm. And I like how we don't ever get a shot of how this works, actually, right? Like, I think Vista herself says, I can't check my work because I can't see the outside of it. Um, We know it was just enough to not be noticed by the guards, but we don't know if that's just because they, like, happened to not look at the wall or that specific section of the wall as they rushed by. Like, it could have just been just good enough, which is another use of these cool, cool new tech, cool new tactics, cool tricks, but while still allowing the tension because it never feels like, oh, our characters are just, like, immune and cheating and, like, can just waltz through this place without any worry. Yeah, you know, um, we've talked on the show off and on about descriptions of things and how sometimes Wildbo just lets you completely imagine something without describing it, really. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes describes things, you know, quite, uh, quite beautifully. Uh, But this is one case where I think he was just trusting that we know how Vista's power works. We've kind of we kind of have practice ex- like like synthesizing what vic- what effect Vista's powers have. So yeah. when he tells you like, oh, she just creates a pocket in the wall and you get inside it and then she pinches it shut. That's a weird thing to, to imagine. But like he doesn't explain it. You're just trusted to envision it. And, and the thing is, I think you, you do. Right. Like, yeah, I had just a perfect kinda automatically do. I had a perfect image of that in my head. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was that was neat. I, I was like, this is one of those things where I was like, you know, I would have been tempted to be like, I have to explain what this looks like because people would, people will be confused. No, he explained it very very concisely, and everyone everyone got it. So yeah, yeah, cool. Ashley here is very interested in how Vista has actually managed to improve her control over her power. Uh, she's asking an unusual number of questions, which is cool because you know Ashley also wants to control her power. Yeah, I mean, this is actually. 
like a really important Ashley chapter, right? Mm-hmm. Like there, a lot of stuff happens around Ashley. And, and I think this is kind of priming us for this. I, I think there's actually a couple cool things here. The first has to do with Vista specifically, because she says like when, when Ashley's like, why meditate? Her response is because you need to change the way you think about your powers, which I think once again, I just want to circle back to this idea of just how wrong March was when with her interpretation of Vista all those arcs ago. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. I think you've brought this up a few times in the past, how exactly that, that the way that Vista was using her power was like the exact way in which March claimed that she wasn't using her power. And of yeah. course, like, like, I think the book definitively claimed the wrongness when Vista like faked her out and killed her. Right. But yeah, but these beats just serve to remind me of just just the the extent of that wrongness yeah it's fantastic yeah um and and i like that her answer was like yeah maybe it worked a little bit but like it's clear it's absolutely clear that her control and versatility has improved tremendously yeah yeah and like that she's willing to do she says basically everything right she said like i tried literally everything in the books like anything that's anything that has ever been written in any book about how to get better control of your powers i've been trying it um which is a a commitment to this that's incredible um and yeah i mean on the ashley side of this i really like just the seeing that ashley who is like really really interested in how how to get control of your power And, and like i said who ashley is who ashley is is going to be called directly into question in this chapter by Chris, right? Like he, he comes into the, this, the end of the chapter and basically challenges her on, on all the progress she's made. And so I think it's really important here that Wild Bo is taking the time throughout the early parts of this chapter with beats like this to show how she's really interested in all these useful ideas that make your powers better or more controlled or more useful or, or any of those things. Right. Yeah. That she's, she's legitimately interested in this. She talks about Victoria's useful ideas of like sewing hair into her costume. Like she's really into all these ideas about control and making yourself better and, and more in control. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, in her case, controlling her power is part of her personal growth because like she always had this belief that, her power obeys her more and is basically just all around better when she is sort of giving into that destructive um, damsel personality. And I think it's probably a very appealing thought to her that like, Hey, you know, you, if you change the way you think about your power, change your relationship with it in some significant way, then not only could you gain control of it, but you could, you could get, you know, get rid of this felt need to inhabit the damsel personality and just just be at peace with I am swan song and I am just as powerful as I ever was. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And I, I really like this beat where they said that's the benefit of being a good guy. The crooks don't have good power labs. And Ashley's response is just like, mm. <laughs> like she'd be like, which is I mean, is agreement. Right. But right. like, I just think that's that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So the trio try to problem solve their way through the dense uh, enclosed maze to wherever Armstrong is. They consider a variety of out of the box options as they go. Ashley is much more willing to accept options that will probably expose their activities because to her, saving Armstrong is the top priority. That said, Ashley is still able to defer to Victoria's plan uh, and retrieve Kinsey's phone for use in contacting Armstrong. Yeah, this is I mean, again, this is another really important Ashley moment that we're setting up here right before the Chris conflict, Um, a moment in which she's agitated, she's nervous about a person she legitimately cares about and Armstrong. um, And you think you would see some of the rougher, gruffer, like more prone to violent and blowing up Ashley. But we don't like, yes, she's more interested in these ideas. This idea, I I like this this line here where Vista's challenging her. And, And after that, after we you know, throw caution to the wind to get to him. Do we escape that trouble for more trouble with an exit ad infinitum? And Ashley responds with sometimes that's all you get. And she's right, right? I mean, sometimes that is your only option here, but just because it feels like your only option doesn't mean it is. And Victoria comes in here with a plan three and Ashley says, yeah, like, Mm -hmm. like, like to echo the beat from before when she said Victoria has all these useful ideas. Here's another useful ideas of Victoria is to come in with, with another option, one that Ashley herself might not have thought of. Yeah. And, and then we see because of that, Ashley's willing to default to that idea says, okay, well you do yours. Well, you take command. We'll do your plan first. Mine will be the backup plan. So despite that agitation, despite that fear, she trusts her teammate and defers to her. Um, 
I, I, I think this is really important, especially because I think this is this is kind of drawing a specific a difference with Chris, who I think mo- either moments before or moments after this, um, they point out that Chris has left his team behind to chase them down. And they note that he doesn't think in terms of teamwork. He thinks in terms of problem solving. Right. So yeah. we're, we're drawing this specific contrast between Ashley, who's who values her team so much that she's willing to listen to the insights of her team and do their plan, even if she wanted to do something different. Whereas Chris just goes off on his own and, and runs ahead and uh, and and suffers for it. Yeah, that, that's really interesting because if you if you think about it, you know Ashley on her own could just blast a hole straight from wherever she's standing to wherever Armstrong is, and probably kill anyone who threatens him. Like she's definitely good at that kind of plan, right? Right. But she's willing to to put the other priorities first, even though it's very painful for her. You know, she's experiencing a lot of a lot of stress here. She she is very tense. She is being that's what's interesting is she she's not succumbing to the temptation to snap and to to deride people when they're arguing with her she's definitely very terse and and kind of to the point with her language but yeah. um it's not it's, she's she's basically just fully focused on the mission and that's you know fantastic growth i think yeah i i agree so Victoria brings Vista up to speed on who Crock of Shit is, uh, also therefore bringing us up to speed. Formerly Fidelis, an ex-Marine and ex-Protectorate heroine from Louisiana. Croc, Louisiana. Wonderful. <laughs> Damn you and your double meanings, Wild Bo. If we had done a name game on Crock of Shit, I, I never would have done the crocodile thing. Like, I never would have drawn that connection. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Um. So... Just the description, you know, we're going to see a lot of crock of shit in the next couple chapters, so we'll spend some time on her. Her lie detection is a thinker power, technically, but in actual application, it's changer. She feels it in her gut because her gut morphs and mutates in response. When she detects lies, she absorbs them, or some, some of the ugliness and intent, makes them part of the changer form she carries with her. She went from being a heroine who turned into a beautiful giantess to being nameless and disfigured. Fucking shards, man. Yeah, fucking shards. Yeah, and like you said, we're going to be spending a whole lot of time on crock of shit uh, in the next chapter, so I don't want to focus on her too much here, but uh, shards, fuck you indeed. It's awful. Mm -hmm. Um, There is this moment here that I wanted to point out specifically for comparison because Ashley says, when I saw a picture of her, it wasn't very crocodile, Um, Mm -hmm. and that's a beat we're going to hit multiple times, and I think it's doing something really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, We'll, we'll see where that leads. So using a combination of damsels, break anything power, and Vista's ability to make tiny holes bigger, they're able to move right through the walls of the labyrinth. Yeah, once again, this is teamwork, right? Emphasizing on teamwork. Victoria's strength moves the the shelf. Uh, Kenzie's tech is what's allowing them to see everything. Vista space warping, Ashley space destroying. All of these elements are key to this plan, and they're employing all of them. And this is meanwhile, big dumb Chris kind of lumbers and sprints and smashes through things um, and roars his way through his problems as opposed to using his team. Like uh, I bet Cole Belcher would have been able to help him get there a little better if he had waited. Yeah. There's something very empowering about this, the, the way this is portrayed, because Victoria spent the last many chapters like with this sort of claustrophobic nightmare feeling of being in a labyrinth and there being basically a monster stalking her through the labyrinth. Yeah, that's been the tone of these last few chapters. And here, with the help of her friends, they are just moving through the walls of the labyrinth like they're not even there. Um, dodging through its guards, like right under their noses, um, completely basically playing them like fools. And like Victoria doesn't think this, right? She's not like, this is so liberating, but it's kind of cool just to see how when they're all working together toward this goal, it's, it ceases to be a labyrinth. Basically it's, it's just, it's their territory. They're so They're so powerful, you know? Yeah, I really like that. I I like that a lot. And I think that really fits in to this this wonderful moment of transition I wanted to to talk with you about real quick a little bit here. Because before we move on to the next part, we see them head from the prison into the office building side. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's basically this prison is described as a castle with two um, with with two halves of a bisected high rise on either mm-hmm. side of it. And, and as they're transitioning from one side to the other, um, 
Victoria notes that the hallway before us divided halfway down with a gate or small portcullis marked the distinction between the castle and the high rise part. With the change came a stark contrast in, well, everything. The tile transitioned smoothly from slate gray and black to a glossy black and tiles with sunset hues like oil on a roadside puddle. Statues embedded in the wall broke up the stone on either side of us, allowing for the transition to the maroon and tinted glass of the high rise. So I think that's, to me, this transition away from the like the, the the medieval castle the the labyrinthian nature of the place to this much more controlled off like clean office building kind of thing i think fits what you were just talking about there where like they're transitioning into this new area and and it's it's a it's a transition for our characters as well it's a transition for victoria and, and her feeling and and her handle on the situation yeah, yeah, that's true. It, it is cool, the description of the office building as being, like, black and maroon. Like, it still has this red and black color scheme that we associate with um, the Red Queen. Yeah, which, oh, yeah. Which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, an, it's a neat, it's a neat uh, conceit there. So Chris calls out to them, and, since he knows that they're there by scent anyway, and they reveal themselves so that they can talk to him. He's got his own face inside the beak muzzle of the monster body. So he's like looking out from within his own mouth. That's just delightful. Yeah. He also has a different outfit thing and is being much more overt with his changer serum injection apparatus now. Yeah. So we're going to talk a lot about Chris in the rest of this chapter. Uh, and I think we have to. There's a lot going on with him. But in this early part where we're just describing what he looks like, I I, I glommed on to a lot of the words that are used in this description, the imagery that a lot of these words like bring up in you. Yeah. Um, w one of the big things to me was like, yes, he's like a, he's like this combination of bird and hairless dog. And, and, and therefore his face is like a combination of a beak and muzzle. But, but the, the word muzzle really stands out to me, right? Because of course, yes, a muzzle is just the pointed part of a dog's face. But muzzle has another meaning, right? A muzzle is a thing you put over the face of an animal to stop them from from biting. It's a it's a controlling device. Um, and then he's also got this this metal collar around his neck. And yes, this is a practical, useful device for injecting him with his different serums. But it's also a metal ring that he's attached around his neck. And again, I think that has some very specific imagery connotations to it. Like I was just like struck by this description of a man who, according to him, has never been more free, has never been able to do what he wanted more. And he's surrounded he's himself by this imagery of, of submission, of, of control. And I just I just found that inherently fascinating, whether it was intended or not. Yeah, I mean, he's he's not he's not literally muzzled, but the use of the word muzzle is sort of yeah. evocative. And, and yeah, he's definitely, definitely colored, right? I, I think that's fair to say. Yeah. The main thing I noticed about the description of his whole current situation is that he's constantly injecting himself with syringes and there's like a graphic splurt of blood every time he does. Yeah. Yeah. Which like I've, I've gotten a lot of shots in my life and I never have blood splurt splurt out in like large quantities um so, so like what he's doing to himself is portrayed as being explicitly damaging and probably painful like we don't see him wince but i'm pretty sure we know that his th that it hurts him right and, yeah and there's there's always been this this fact that we've known that when chris uses his transformations there are consequences right like he he fills a toilet bowl with organs or, or whatever right mm -hmm. so it's it's just kind of sucks to be him right that's <laughs> yeah of overall the sense you get yeah and, and i i like that a lot because like there's just the fact that he he's doing it so much that he needs this delivery device like always on him right. yeah i think is indicative of like how how far down this road like how like if we use these injections as drug metaphors like he's addicted right like he mm -hmm. he can't be without them he's increased the dose yeah that's, yeah. A, that's a good point yeah yeah so he continues to be a huge prick, but it's clearly about him proving his theory about humanity using Breakthrough as his demonstration. He mocks Ashley for no longer being willing to kill him for interfering, and Victoria defends her, saying that the word that sums her up is ascension. Oh, I love this so much, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a wonderful moment, and I was I was reading this in the airport yesterday, and I like wanted to stand up and cheer. But I was in public, so I couldn't. Um, uh -huh. But it is like it's a it's a really wonderful way of describing. It. And I think it's it's like low key 
a, a, a phrasing in which Ashley would love herself while also, I think, being very accurate. That's just inherently true. Like, I think it's phrased to a like a word that Ashley would appreciate. But yeah, but also the truth. Um, and like if we look back on this arc, if we look back on breaking, especially the early parts of the arc, we see a Victoria who was having doubts about Ashley, right? Who, who we were witnessing people break. We had this whole moment um, around the around the Gary Nieves stuff where Victoria seemed genu- genuinely concerned that Ashley was backsliding or reverting and called her out. Remember, she she specifically called her out. And Chris counters uh, Victoria's word of ascension with the word facade that Ashley assumed a personality after the murder of her parents, and all she's done here is assumed a different personality, put on a different mask. Um, and, and this actually, Chris's argument here lines up with what Victoria was questioning about her earlier in the arc a little bit. Remember, like she was saying that, that maybe underneath this, this swan song, there was just more damsel, Mm -hmm. um, that like this, this fear that she had, but here now at the end of the arc, her response to Chris's thing is just nah. And, and it's not just that she's putting on a performance for Chris. It's not just that she's like, oh, I actually might kind of agree with you, but I don't want to be seen to agree with you. We're in Victoria's head and we see no moment where she thinks to herself, oh, he's got a good point about her. She is 100 percent like I think 100 percent. By the end of this arc, convinced of Ashley's ascension. And yeah. I think that's wonderful. And it makes sense because we we have all these great moments of Ashley being great like you know holding back from blowing people away when i think it's safe to say old ashley would have um letting kenzie like fall asleep latched on her leg kind of adorably and then just being super mama bear defensive of of kenzie in a way that victoria doesn't quite fully approve of but at least she can approve of the sentiment behind it and then here we have her you know putting the the mission first and and i think victoria yeah like we haven't watched victoria change her mind but we know Victoria well enough to know that she probably has changed her mind. Yeah. And and I like this as a moment, like there's moments like this where you can use antagonists and use conflict like this to reveal stuff to your characters, right? Like there, there is a, there is a, a version of this argument that could go, Oh man, Chris has some points like, Oh man. Um, actually now I'm really worried about Ashley, but I don't think that's what this moment is. I, I think, I think what we've done with Ashley throughout this entire arc and especially like very quickly here at the beginning of this chapter to kind of refresh our memory of, of how well she's been doing is really make the final case for Ashley as this improved ascended person. And now we have Chris come in here. And and so I think the text makes it very clear that Chris is just wrong, that that he is just incorrect and he is uh, projecting a little bit. Um, And we'll get into that a little bit more as we get through his conversation. But yeah, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that the, the, the textual read of this is, is, hey, Chris, you're wrong. Right. I mean, I, I think I felt ever since Eclipse, when we really got to know how Ashley's head works, I, I always felt that the the idea that, you know, it's just a facade was was a vast oversimplification of right. Ashley's inner life. And, yeah. and, and Chris is just wrong. And he's wrong in a way that is, of course biased toward making it seem like he's right about the world and the way people are. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the idea of the the central idea of, oh, she just put on, uh, just created a personality. He almost kind of contradicts himself, doesn't he? Because he says, he says, uh, after she killed her parents, Ashley assumed a personality um, that was damsel. And then she got so used to that personality that everything underneath it faded away and crumpled. Um, And then she was just that damsel personality. But then he is like, well, you're not really this person because it's just a facade. And it's like, well, I mean, if if you're if you have the ability as a person to uh, lean into something so hard to fake it till you make it, like he says, um, then it's as just as legitimate for her to be doing it on the swan song end. Right. Um, And I think it's just because the concept of fake it till you make it is not something that he can deal with. Like he he specifically says that in this in this chapter. Yeah, right. Well, he doesn't actually like it, it, that's what's fascinating about Chris's character is he may be the one member of Breakthrough who's most desperate to change. Yeah. While simultaneously being the most unwilling to attempt to change using like methods that will actually work. He, he He's so he's so sure that he's going to achieve this 
through injecting himself with stuff and turning himself into a monster. Yep. And he he's never really given the therapy or the group dynamic a chance yeah. while all the other members of the group have just let let each other change them right yeah. as as a as part of a group project almost yeah i mean we see invista uh, a person who is willing to read and try every single thing the book says in order to change to improve her power mm. um we see a person in ashley who ha- hears that and is interested in that and then we see a person in chris who says the only way the only way to do this is this way is is specifically drug injections to turn me into the thing i want to be that's that's the only way I could ever be free of my programming, be free of this person. I didn't want to be and change into this person that I want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And he's wrong. Yeah. It, it's so good. And like, here's Chris being Chris right here. They say eyes are the windows of the soul and your eyes are blank from corner to corner. Says it all. <laughs> Not right now. I said, kind of true. Cryptid said, shit. I thought of that one a bit ago. Was holding on to it. God, he's such a baby. He is. He is a baby. But yeah, like you said, this is so wonderfully Chris. And it shows to me, like, I think this is the this is the moment where you're like, oh, Chris is just wrong, right? Because he formed this opinion of Ashley a long time ago, and he's been holding on to this opinion of who she is and waiting to make this speech, looking forward to it. But he's running off of old information, right? In his expert analysis, he's running off of old information. Ashley's eyes are not blank and soulless right now. We've seen that throughout the course of this chapter. We've seen the transformation of her eyes. Ashley is not the person Chris thinks she is. He is wrong. And this seals it in the most hilariously, Chris, you're stupid kind of way. Yeah. And it's just the idea that he's been like saving up this wicked burn. Yeah. It just, it, it, what it telegraphs is, how much time he spends waste like how much time he wastes on this shitty um tearing each other down thing where it's like look if you really didn't care which is what you consistently claim mm-hmm. then you wouldn't have like 80% of your brain dedicated to thinking about sick burns on on the people who you actually probably care about yeah i mean part of me like wonders if chris going to shin was like at least partially like a, a kid running away from home moment like where you run away from home just to draw attention to yourself and you kind of secretly hope that your team is going to come chase you down, that your parents are going to come find you and then they'll they'll feel bad because you left that like, I, did, you, did you ever do that? Did you ever run away from home to teach your parents a lesson because like they did something that made you mad and you're like, I'm going to run away from home and you're not going to be able to find me and you're going to miss me and feel bad about it. Um, that feels a little what what Chris was doing here. And then like nobody came nobody came to find him yeah um and then they when they eventually did he's just so desperate to prove at this point that he's fine without them that he didn't need them that uh everything's good Uh, it just it just comes off as so performative to me absolutely absolutely um so we we do get some sense of what his big goal is that he is you know literally programmed to be going after so he talks about sending people into space with space adapted bodies using his, his advanced knowledge of powers from Sheen's labs. And this is I mean, you used big goal there intentionally because he's just he's still as much of a slave to the instincts that he was always a slave to before. Right. He's yeah. he's, he's following the programming of do something big. Um, it's, it's so much still following that that lab rat programming. Right. Um, and he says here, I have a direction, Victoria. It's being my own person with control over my own existence. But you don't, Chris, like you aren't. You're like you're still you're still just following that programming to a certain extent. Right. I I mean, I think the text even even ah, man, I wish I had the an exact quote. But yeah, like I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's fairly explicit that like this is his attempt to fulfill the programming. And he 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 likes to believe that he's breaking out of it but he's very he's very deluded in a number of ways right he's very yeah kind of immature and self-deceptive um almost like he's very young and has very little actual life experience (laughs) almost as if yeah i love i love victoria's like uh pretty clever for a two-year-old line or something that was that was really great um so i think like there's this there's this this moment like he says he, he calls breakthrough hypocritical. He says Ashley's just put on a facade. But like like I said, I think this is just projection. I feel like he's talking about himself. Um, and, and I feel like that, that thing that Ashley says at the end of this conversation is absolutely fundamentally true. He wants us to hate him. 
he wants Breakthrough to hate him and he's going to do whatever he needs to do that. I can't remember who it was, but back when we were talking about Chris in one of our discussion questions a, a few weeks ago, someone, one of our commenters mentioned that uh, Chris is basically just begging to like be emotionally and possibly physically just brutalized by his old team. And, yeah. and, and this moment, what he's doing here, the way he's talking, I think Mick confirms that is absolutely 100 percent true. That's what he wants. I mean, if you look at the outcome of this situation, I think that's very well supported, actually, Yeah, because yeah. he gets just what he wants. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, we we get a little bit of we get some dribbles of uh, setting, you know, background information here from Chris. Vista asks, how much of this did you plan? This it's stupid politics and a bit of teacher, a bit of one of the bigger precogs. I just showed up, enjoyed the show, and figured I'd fulfill my promise to Panacea while I did it. This is Dino Watch 20, 2019. We have a sighting. <laughs> Sound the alarms. We have a sighting. We have a sighting. Um, this is one of our biggest ongoing mysteries in the book, right? Like, what is Dinah doing and why is she doing it? And I, I appreciate that the, the book has chosen not to play this card just yet because I think it's one of those things that, like, once we know about would kind of automatically by its very nature slide most if not all the puzzle pieces into place about the the overarching structure of what's happening and it's not time for that yet and i think we're getting there right i think i think we're gonna we're gonna see dinah sooner rather than later in this book at this point but i appreciate that we've held on to this because it is one of those really big final pieces of this puzzle and it could be that this isn't even dinah but um yeah, I feel I feel, feel like, like it probably is. Yeah, it, it certainly feels like it is to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 just cool that it's dribbled in here in a way where it feels organic to the conversation. Yeah. Um, if anything, what feels inorganic is Chris's bullshit description of his motivations for why he is in yeah. the situation. Yeah, I just showed up, enjoyed the show, figured yeah. I'd fulfill my promise. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right? yeah. You're someone who I I think promises mean a lot too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so he then admits that he played a major part in incapacitating Victoria and in handing her over to Amy. And he gets a fucking why, but it's not at all funny this time. Mm -mm. Uh, he seems to have some clear, like he seems to have some kind of convoluted justification involving teacher interfering with Amy for why he did this. But it's not entirely clear and sounds like complete bullshit to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it is very possible that there is one thing true here is that as part of teachers general fuckery plan uh amy was was arranged to find some shit that messes with her head right i think that i think that can be absolutely true that that it would make sense for teacher in order to to poke at specific holes you know screwing with amy would be a good one we don't really get any yeah. detail of what that information is or exactly how that resulted and and this this has kind of changed our interpretation or at least one interpretation of everything that went down. Like like at one point in these chapters, we were wondering, did Amy like masterfully orchestrate this whole thing just just to, to lead to Victoria being passed out and alone so she could get to her? And it doesn't seem like that's what happened. But and I think we want to make this, this very clear before we like say, oh, teacher arranged all this. Well, then it was teacher. Uh, while it is possibly true that the breakdown or the domino effect that Amy has been going under since before Victoria got there could be teacher oriented. It doesn't excuse anything that Amy did, right? Like it doesn't like it doesn't excuse how she handled her breakdown. It doesn't excuse. And even if Chris set up the encounter, it does not excuse Amy for putting her hands on Victoria, for using her power on Victoria, for, for being there in that room with her, despite Victoria's clear objection to it. Like, like we can add this complicated wrinkle to it. And I, and I like it. I like this idea that Amy is such a fragile person that, um, the, the messing with that he tried to do to Victoria that doesn't work is super effective on Amy. Uh, but that doesn't excuse anything that she's done. Certainly, certainly not. No. I mean, like at, at the most you can be like, I, I was starting to think about what it could be. And I was like, well, maybe she like, maybe teacher dropped some fake information about, what but like basically similar to the fake journal entries that victoria had but like insinuating that victoria was actually open to amy coming back into her life and then this would cause amy to be very confused and uh you know maybe even understandably confused when victoria arrives and, and treats her horribly yeah because 
she like like we've we've given we've given Amy a really hard time consistently throughout the whole show because she never seems to understand what she did. And honestly, I literally think that's just because she's incapable of like empathy. But it's also possible that it's partially because her her picture of where Victoria is has been tampered with by teacher. I, I don't know. Just just the yeah. just, it's just it's fun to think about what exactly Chris means by this, because it could actually have some interesting consequences, right? Sure. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of very passionate conversation that's happened, you know, here in the community around Amy, um, this arc. And I think it's, it's, she's an incredibly complicated character who is, who is more horrible and frustrating than not. Um, And, and I, I appreciate these more wrinkles we're learning, right? Like I appreciate like, the idea that that um, Chris arranged this for her and she just eagerly was like, OK, cool, uh, yeah. and took advantage of it. I, I enjoy the idea that that teacher was specifically targeting her and was successful because she is not better because she was is susceptible to this for the exact reasons why um, it didn't work as well on Breakthrough. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't have a support network. For yeah, one thing. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So as they're talking about this. Victoria says, um, putting me in, sorry, by putting me in that room with a monster. And then Chris replies, you're more monstrous than she is. So what do you make of that? (laughs) Well, I mean, that's a particularly loaded phrase, right? Because we know to Chris monstrosity is advantageous. Mm -hmm. He wants to be a monster. He sees, he sees monster as better than not monster. So I think like in his mind, what he's actually doing is saying uh, Amy's weak and you are better than her in that regard um, in, in in doing terrible things. And I think that's kind of it's bullshit. Like it's it's Chris projecting again. But um, it, it, I just like that that kind of comes off meaning one thing. And then you think about it for a minute and go, well, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's Chris. That's a compliment. He's expressing his ad- admiration. Yeah. Well, what's interesting that I don't even really know how Victoria is monstrous even in his worldview. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't um, know. Yeah, I, I want to find out more about how he sees Victoria specifically. Yeah, I was honestly, I was kind of struggling with that just as I was talking to you. Like it, it, in my mind, it popped in. Well, exactly how, Chris? Like what, what did what she did? Is it because she, she killed that one person? Because, you know, I mean, like I'm sure that doesn't make her feel good, but that's not a, a monstrous action. Yeah, I don't know. Like he seems to respect the most fucked up members the most. And maybe he sees her as being the most fucked up. I, yeah. I don't, I'm, I'm really not sure exactly. Or he could just be literally like talking about the wretch and mm-hmm. like, like he, he looks as monstrosity like as both metaphor and like physical, yeah. right? You're, like he looks yeah. at the, the physical as the most, as, as one of the key indicators of that. So, yeah, that's interesting. I, I suspect we'll find out more about him and his feelings about Victoria. I think you're right. So Victoria charges as Cole Belcher fires a katan no jutsu at them, <laughs> mentally preparing herself to kill them and to have Ashley annihilate their dead bodies. Damn, girl. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Victoria is having it rough right now. Right. I mean, like it's been a it's been a rough arc for our girl and it's culminating here with the person in front of her just casually telling her that he her old teammate arranged for her worst nightmare to come true. Right. Um, she's angry. She's really angry. And I think we see a little bit of that glory girl come out of that anger where she's just like, well, we're going to have to do it. And if we have to do it, Ashley can just dispose of the evidence. Yep. Yep. Ashley sort of serves the same role that Amy used to, except in the opposite direction. (laughs) Oh Jesus. I hadn't even put that together. (laughs) (laughs) So Victoria just beats the shit out of him. Doesn't she? Yeah. She injures Cole Belcher, shatters, Two of cryptids mutated rat piston arms. Um, and then after they've just like crippled these two guys, they threaten them into retreating. And I think Chris's crowning moment of patheticness is retreating while saying, you're lucky I don't really care. Right. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Like it, fucking Chris. Like this is he's he's basically lost. Um, and then he's like, yeah, I don't actually care anyway. So yeah, right. bye. And but I. Uh, to to kind of like we're, we're at the end of the arc, right? So I want to kind of do these moments of of bringing things full circle, and the way she beats the shit out of Chris in this in this manner really reminded me of her sparring and her punching bag, you know, lessons 
back in 14.1. Yeah. Um, like it's, it's all about instincts, remember? And Victoria lets her instincts kind of take over here, right? We don't see her thinking through this. We don't see her wondering, um, Ooh, should, how much should I use the wretch? Like uh, too much, but she just, she just trusts her instincts and yeah, she beats the shit out of them. She breaks their arms. She hurts them. Uh, she doesn't kill them though. Like there's no indication here that, that Cole Belcher is dead. She definitely hit, hits him really hard. Yeah, I think basically um, we don't see her internal thought process of like um, measuring out her strength and kind of like calculating movements to minimize the harm, right? She's like smashing his legs and, and, and trying to basically make it so that he can't stand up anymore. And then, like you said, just like kind of almost reflexively smashes Chris's limbs when when they come near her. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. um, I I do agree that that's that's an echo of like, just go with your instincts. You're more effective. Yeah. And the the way she kicks the leg. I don't know. I I went back and read 14.1 and the the way she kicks out is is, is similar to the way she kicked out on the bag at the point Uh when Annalise was like, no, trust your instincts a little bit more. So I, I feel like the book's trying to draw that connection here. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. So what's interesting, though, at the end of this chapter is that Chris actually does cover for these women. Um, yeah. He 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 plays it off. He tells an elaborate lie to the to the sheen guards about how he did the lights and him and Cobelcher had a fight. Um, did he really need to? Did he need to make up a story like they're, they're out of sight? Right. If yeah. they were going to come back into sight, then that would be it for them. So he could have said whatever. So. So why did he say this? Oh, it's almost as if uh, his whole thing is bullshit, right? Uh-huh. Like, because the whole thing is bullshit. And like, yes, it is true that the moment where he he kind of retreats and and then decides to make up the lie comes after the point where they could easily kill him. Right. Like, like Ashley is literally saying, I can I can punch a hole in you and then Vista can make uh can make it look like a bullet hole or something make it look yeah. like something that wasn't us was we can good. we can dispose yeah. of you in a way that would never indicate to us so yes it is true that his his uh submission comes after that point but it also comes after them saying natalie and armstrong are in danger right like there, there's this really interesting thing here where his last line is that he doesn't care. And if he didn't care, he wouldn't make up a story. If he didn't care, he wouldn't go down this way. If he didn't care, he would continue to call their bluff. He apparently was convinced that these are people that wouldn't kill him. He said that at the end, like you're bluffing you, you, I, and he gives up on calling their bluff and he goes above and beyond that, which is not, not narc on them. Like he still could, like he could have, they're out the window now, right? Like, like they're, they're up the hole in the wall. They're gone. He could say if he was really just doing this because they threatened to kill him, he could just be like, yeah, they were here. Um, yeah. go get them. Right. I, I saw who it was. Right. Their cover is blown now. I mean, in, in fact, even from the beginning of this scene, he sees them there and he calls to them and engages them in dialogue an extended dialogue at, at no point. Is he like, you know, radioing in, the the troops or you know or or he could have just like kept tracking them and cornered them right but yeah what he really wanted was to have a conversation yeah he wanted to talk to them again because he wanted to prove something to them because and and you know why (laughs) it's because the last time he talked with them kenzie dropped a fucking bomb on him right and he 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 wants the last word and he doesn't get it here (laughs) i mean he tries to get it like you're lucky i don't fucking care is his way of getting the last word but it just rings so hollow especially when when our characters get to hear him lie for them yeah i mean uh, you you saying that kind of just triggered me to remember when victoria notes about ashley like it was really easy to seem aloof and cold all the time when you don't care about anything yeah but but here in this chapter she obviously cares about armstrong and is having a very human reaction to that. And she's yeah. not able to keep up the like, uh, you know, serene personality anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I, I think there's a lot in the next chapter that's going to enforce this idea of Chris's uh, whole thing is is bullshit. And there's a good person under there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Scott, let's move on to 14.Z. Maybe right. the last chapter of the interlude or maybe. the uh, arc. Yay. Yay, maybe. <laughs> So yeah, Armstrong interlude, but 
it's one of those fun interludes where the story plays with our expectations a little bit because at first it's Camille, it's not Armstrong for, for a little bit. And Camille is a bit overwhelmed by the flurry of people taking care of and asking rapid fire question, rapid fire but oh so polite questions of him. And Mrs. Madison, sorry, Miss Madison, who we don't actually, I didn't recognize that name either. I suppose I should have. Um, but yeah, that's Natalie's name. Yeah. Um, but the story doesn't really hold you in suspense for long. I think it's just meant to make you feel a little bit overwhelmed the same way he does. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of fun at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> did we know Armstrong's first name? I don't think that was ever information no. given to us. Did we know Natalie's last name? If we did, I had forgotten it. Sorry, Natalie. Um, so, yeah, they both worked as like mini reveals for me in the moment. But you're right. It, it holds the information for like just as long as possible without like getting you too confused. Uh, it doesn't even really treat them as reveals so much. Just like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I mean, I think it's mostly just done for that for that mild effect. And yeah. I mean, I, I, do, I do think that I do think that our anticipation about who Armstrong was was maybe supposed to be different because sure. like I I he he is he's portrayed as being this like like powerful um fatherly figure in so many important people's lives I was totally imagining like a tall barrel-chested like you know stern like stately yeah um you know, with a loud, boisterous Santa Claus voice or something, you know, <laughs> like like you, you automatically imagine these things. And Camille is is not physically anything like what I'm what I automatically imagine. But I think yeah. the, and, and that for a second was a little bit of a, a, a disorientating effect. But then you're immediately like, no, I see exactly why he has this effect on people. Yeah. And, and it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And what I love about this is that Wild Bo starts his work to define Camille's character in the first line. Right. The first line of this chapter is obsequious was the word, mm -hmm. which is not just demonstrating Armstrong as the type of guy who uses, you know, kind of more wordy vocabulary, but also that he's the type of guy that thinks through things in this way. Right. It's not just him not noting how servile the people of Shin are. Right. It's him consciously thinking about them and then consciously selecting a word in his consciousness to define them. Right. And it immediately creates in Armstrong this kind of character who observes and analyzes and ponders and thinks about people on on like a, a fundamental. I you are a puzzle that I want to figure out kind of way, which is exactly what we see Armstrong doing throughout this entire chapter. Yeah. I mean, he, he seems to have this extremely robust and extensive toolkit for analyzing people. Yeah. And, and I'm going to draw this whole giant paragraph out, first of all, because I love it and I, I actually find it like <laughs> hilarious and, I, and I, I feel like personally attacked by it also. Um, <laughs> but, but furthermore, I'm just going to read it and then we can talk about sure, it. Sure. Sure. Miss Madison was the, was of a type that Camille had seen often enough when talking to prospective employees who were fresh out of college, traumatized by the academia to the point of perpetual anxiety, wide-eyed and fidgety, 20 or 30 pounds overweight, not used to sleeping normal hours, giving evidence to faint circles under the eyes. Someone who'd had enough on their plate that they'd started and ended the journey from adolescence to adult with the shakiest of ideas what an adult was to wear. Where some clung to the teenager look, Miss Madison had lunged for a more formal adult look that she wore with what looked like perpetual discomfort, a black skirt, a formal shirt, a styled suit jacket, and large round glasses, a boring haircut. <laughs> oh, holy shit, I'm dead. <laughs> um, no, but so, I, and I love this specifically because it's, it's basically the Victoria fashion teardown. Right. Right. But it's, it's got a, to it's got a very different spin on it. It's coming from a different place. And it's almost like more comprehensive yeah. than Victoria usually is, right? Yeah. I mean, and it, 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 the, the thing that's fun about it is, again, we're kind of like one of the things we have to do in, in, in chapters when we bring new characters into it is like show their bona fides, right? Like we have to like we're establishing Armstrong as this guy who's very good at reading people. How do we do that? Well, Let's have him kind of dissect Natalie a little bit here and specifically Natalie's fashion, which is something through the eyes of our protagonist we know is a rather accurate description of her fashion. Um, and, and what I like about this is like we give shit 
we give Victoria shit every time she drags Natalie's sense of style, right? Like, we're just like, oh, Victoria. But it's not like Victoria is just this mean, vindictive person who's just going to, like, decide she doesn't like someone and then decide that their fashion's bad. It's like, the truth here is that Natalie's not great at style. Like, that's just the honest truth. And Mm -hmm. we see here that Armstrong is also like, yeah, it's not great. (laughs) This is is not great. and And I feel like it's more of an assessment. Like, Victoria tends to look at people and think about what she would do if they hired her as their personal fashion consultant. Right. Uh-huh, she's, uh-huh. she's like, this is, you know, Natalie would look better with, with this kind of thing. And, and she, you know, that belt doesn't go with those shoes. Right. It's, it's yeah. about, it's about how this could be improved uh, about like, it's almost from a place of like, if only Natalie would ask me for help, I would have so much good advice for her. Yeah. W- whereas Camille here is just sort of, um, doing like a Sherlock's home Sherlock Holmes like once over look looking her over and uh, like assessing the fact that she's perpetually anxious fidgety overweight because she's not sleeping and and anxious and her life is out of control yeah and like uh like skipped over her adolescence due to stress and like gets a and what what's the, the fact is we know this is all a pretty accurate read on Natalie because we we know her pretty well too so yeah so like you said, we're portraying Armstrong as just being laser good at uh, at, at analyzing people. Yeah. Um, I like if if Victoria looks at at Natalie's hair and says, fucking why <laughs> Armstrong looks at Natalie's hair and says, this is why. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yeah. So, you know, of course, he goes on to think that he finds this endearing Mm -hmm. and he basically finds everything endearing because he finds everything relatable. Yeah. Um, Armstrong might not be a cape, but his superpower is empathy. Mm -hmm. And and I think what's more is that that like like we hinted at at the beginning of the show, Wildbo is using that superpowered empathy to effectively draw a lot of very specific lines between characters and amongst characters in in this chapter in this end of the interlude in this in this arc um in a really really effective way that i really enjoy Mm -hmm. yeah and so i wanted to talk about the pen carrier for a bit because this is really fun matt um in the early part of the chapter they're talking to this pen carrier which they never explain what a pen carrier is um is it just literally like a a servant that carries the pen around (laughs) I mean, for some reason, my brain sort of went to like the concept of a cup bearer where it's yeah, like yeah. their job is, I, I mean, I guess they're expected to carry a cup around, but but that's just sort of the excuse they're for why the, they're there. The gopher. Yeah. 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 So anyway, this this pen carrier is talking about his life. He's talking about how he is rised up. He was picked randomly by luck and given this huge burden which is very heavy to carry. There's tons of expectations put on him because of this random burden that he had no control over. He works hard and has a lot of stress, but he's been elevated into a position of great importance. Um, Does that sound like anything to you? (laughs) Maybe we're making some parallels to our characters. Yeah, I mean, like in this chapter where the text through Armstrong is kind of ruminating on this concept of what it means to be a cape. Who who are capes as a whole? the good parts, the bad parts, the darkness, the light. We have this kid struggling with the burden of a similar such existence, right? This thing that that he didn't ask for, that was just randomly thrust on him that is is complicating his life, but but the potential there is to is great as well, right? Mhm. Yeah. I, I yeah. think I liked it a lot. And and it, I think it keeps a little a little more specific here, right? Because Natalie is noting that that she understands the pressures he's feeling because she's done all the stuff. And after everything she's done, her parents aren't happy yet. Um, and he just calmly replies, that's their failure, not yours. And I love that. Victoria, yeah. it's not your fault. It's Carol's, it's Carol's fault, Victoria. It's not your fault, Victoria. Yeah. And it makes Natalie actually like laugh involuntarily. Yeah. yeah. So Camille asks after Sveta and Nash and uh, Ashley, Natalie has a surprisingly negative take, I think. I mean, I, I get it. Like, I'm not criticizing Natalie for what she says here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suppose it's good that the story is pointing out for us that Natalie only really sees a slice of the team's life. And often that slice coincides with particular types of crises where her help is required and the team is not at their best. So it's gotten so kind of burdensome for her that she's actually thinking about leaving. Yeah. I mean, it's depressing, right? It's depressing to see her that way. This girl so enamored with capes and powers and the life of, 
of, of being a superhero that she like wanted to be part of this and wanted to join this. And she's seen the reality of it. She's seen the dark, depressing parts. Um, but like you said, it makes sense. This is this is the reality of being a hero, right? It's really hard. There's there's lots of bad stuff constantly. Um, it seems like it's always getting worse and it seems like you're forced into situations where you have to make questionable situations that an outside observer like Natalie is like, oh, I don't know about that one. Um, I think to me, Natalie has always kind of been an audience surrogate at times, right? She's the normal one watching from the sidelines, um, seeing the worst of things, observing and, and, and sometimes quietly passing judgment from the sidelines and struggling to see anything but the badness. Um, so in, in a way, I relate to her quite a bit with this. When I look at when I look at the capes and the terrible, awful things we've seen in the story and just like, Jesus, how how is it going to get better? Like how, how is this ever going to be good? So I, I related to that a whole bunch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting to think back over the specific instances where she was involved and how those were some of the darker uh, times, you know? I mean, what, Um, what breakthrough has used her for, like you said, is whenever they're doing something questionable when they're like, uh, Hey, uh, let me know what you think about this. Yeah. Or her getting sucked into the whole goddess prison scenario, which is probably deeply traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's this one moment where the one thing she does say about uh, to, to kind of directly answer Armstrong question, Armstrong's question is she says, Ashley's really grown since I first met her. Sveta's, Obviously, Sveta's doing terrific. And his response, his internal thoughts to himself is, she's going through a breakup with grit teeth and she's keeping up her day to day. A body doesn't change that. Um, So, like, I I love this. Like, again, you see how empathetic and how understanding he is that, like, this this idea that, like, obviously Sveta's doing great because she has a body now. And he's like, well, well, hold on. Yeah, just because just because one good thing is happening in her life, like, doesn't mean that she's not suffering emotionally because of this other stuff. Like, yeah. Like that, yeah. like getting a body does not stop you from being hurt about being brokenhearted. Like absolutely, as much as she's putting on a good face for it and she's keeping up her day to day, as as he says, like it's not it's not obvious that Sveta's doing great. Um, but of course, we, yeah. we we do get there by the end of this chapter. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing how quickly you can get used to things being better uh, in your life. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Take them for granted. Yeah, yeah. I, I I can't wait for that moment. So the inner voice and perspective of Camille Armstrong, I think, is like pretty much instantly makes him one of my favorite characters. And yeah. I feel like I could analyze who he is and what Wild Bo's doing with him all day. Yeah, I, I love him. I, like, I think empathetic characters to me are always inherently likable because like they just care about everyone. Right. Like, yeah, w- we talked last week about how. And, and I put a lot I put a lot of pressure on Armstrong in my head. Right. Like I was like. What happens to Armstrong here will be the book making a statement about the world. Like he here he is a good character who cares about people who sees in a pair of humans the goodness, who sees the light in them. And what happens to him is the, is the book kind of saying what he thinks about that, what it thinks about that, what happens to people who believe it that way. So I put a lot of pressure on who this character is and what's going to happen to him in the story. And I think it's so amazing to to see him as like every every bit as good and positive and out like and and upstanding. Like, oh, yeah. And, and hope bringing as he is. Right. Because last episode I was saying like, man, like the story is really making us like Armstrong and really be afraid of what <laughs> could happen to him. Right. And and then when we got to this interlude, I was like, oh, my God, I, I, I love him. I like him even more than I did before. Yeah. Um. Like he just seems like such an admirable, like and and like a person you'd want to emulate. Where he's, I mean, he's he's kind of like the person who I want to be more like. Where he has an in, endless reserve of empathy and patience and ability to, yeah, to relate to people and, and their struggles and and therefore extend them, you know, the benefit of the doubt and and reach out to them and connect to them. It's it's all like these extremely desirable qualities that that you wish you could cultivate in yourself, you know, and and not easy to do though. And so it's just really cool to have this example to point to and and say, Hey, that guy, he's doing it right. Yeah. He may may be a fictional character, but that's still, that's kind of what I, what's what I want to be more like. No, I agree with that. I, I I think, I think he is, he is the type of personality that should be, should be uh, glorified a little bit. Um, And again, if the book had decided to take this character and kill him brutally, um, that would be making a statement. 
right? Yeah. I mean, like, if, if you take a character here who, like, always tries to see the good in people, who looks at parahumans and acknowledges the darkness but chooses to see the light and then have him mercilessly murdered by a parahuman, um, that is definitely making a statement, a thematic statement about your book. And yeah. the book did not do that. So yeah. that, by not doing that, you've also made a statement, right? Yeah, um, I think so. But yeah. yeah, not not just that, but by having him be rescued by a terrible, terrible monster. Yeah. Yeah. The, but the one the one that he always believed in, the one he always saw. Yeah, we're, we're jumping ahead. But yeah, we're I mean, like ahead. this is it's so it's so important and amazing. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So he gives some of his perspective to Natalie because she's kind of, you know, dumping her conscience on him. And he doesn't really try to persuade her. He just talks about how it's kind of always been really bad and there's mm-hmm. always been a lot of cause for worry, but there's also cause for hope. Yeah. I, she gives this line that is good people don't necessarily mean they do good things. And I think that's that's like a pretty powerful statement there. And yeah. he's like and he's like, yeah, you're right. But they're trying. And and as long as they're trying, like. I, I believe it's going to be OK. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I love that's going on on the edges of this chapter is how much we see the traits and the habits of both Sveta and Ashley echoed through Armstrong. Um, I think it really quietly sells how much of an influence he's had on these people in his life. Like uh, uh, there's something specifically I want to point out with Ashley that's just specific word usage. But here I think we see, if not the origin, but the reinforcement of Sveta's relentless optimism, right? Like, e- even in the state of horror, as Natalie lists one thing after another that they have against them, like, uh, we're Gimel and we're alone, Shin wants hates us, uh, Earth C wants to take us over, uh, there's all these things, like, against us, and he's just like, yeah, but we have good, smart people working on it, and as long as we have that, we have hope. As long as we have people like Breakthrough, who, yes, are good people that do not always do good things. That is true. But they are trying as hard as they can to be better people who do better things. And and I I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. And he's clearly someone who has seen some shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, like you know, like when they're trying to intimidate him and he's like jokes on them, they have no idea what I've had to deal with. It kind of gives you this sense that yeah, he's he's probably like he was a PRT director. Yeah. You know, he's 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 dealt with some pretty bad, some pretty heinous parahuman stuff. You you could just you could just assume. And he still has this perspective where it's genuinely positive. Like, man, contrast this to the perspective Pigot had where she's just like these people are all right. monsters. And I hate right. them. Yeah. And I, I think I think that that it was always terrible line of thinking helps contradict one of the sentiments that we've seen throughout this book of man, I wish we could just go back to the way things were, right? If we could just go back to the way things were, things would be so better. And Armstrong's opinion on that is, no, they, they look, they were always kind of bad. Like, like yeah. there's not like, you can't look back on the past with these rose colored glasses, these b- before the end of the world, things were great. Um, yeah. no, no, right. like it was, it was always kind of bad. And, and, and maybe we've just gotten used to the badness a little more. Um, maybe we aren't as shocked at the horrible things anymore because we've gotten used to them. But that doesn't mean that that things are like a billion times worse. But we, right. we try. We, we good people go out there and they try to make the world better and they don't always succeed. But as long as they try, you got that hope thing. And that's yeah. all you need. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, folks, we're not getting inbringer attacks every month now. Yeah. So that's 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 <laughs> good, right? I mean, there's that's- one hanging out with the giant mountain man but yeah you know she's she's probably gonna she's helping she's fine she's a helper yeah um so this line camille knew he had a long-standing habit of finding parts of himself in others empathy run amok maybe when he was young he had alienated people responding to every complaint and problem by relating to it man same same (laughs) Yeah, um, I, I have a I have a sister, a younger sister who has a very highly tuned, very sharp sense of empathy. And it, it makes your life harder. It does. Uh-huh. Like, I, I consider myself a fairly empathetic person, but um, she has like definitely empathy run amok. Uh, not I mean, I don't mean to say it like in a negative way, but she just feels everything that people feel. And that makes life really hard sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think I was connecting to the sp- specifically to the part where uh, you respond to every complaint by relating to it. Yeah. It's like 
people don't actually want that. But no. it's it's hard to it's hard to accept that. I think when you're I don't know, I feel a bit conceited calling myself yeah. naturally empathetic, but but like it's hard to it's hard to think like what you you don't want me to take your problem onto myself and suffer. <laughs> That's not why you're telling me it. I don't no. understand why you're telling me it yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's it's uh it took me a long time to figure that one out. Yeah, and and um, what I what I love about this is that you can see a situation where a story could take a character with with this kind of empathy run amok and draw out the worst possible results from him, right? Like not not just that he's alienating people, but empathizing so much that it blinds you to the bad in people, right? Um, th- that's not what this book is doing, right? That's not what it's doing through this character. And yeah. and I think uh, there's no better example of that than Armstrong's kind of quiet musings on Chris when he's standing in the room with him. Um, he can't help but relate to Chris. And we know from the last chapter that Chris is this super complicated guy who's not simply the horrible monster that he wants everyone to believe, believe he is. And sure, he's done horrible things, no question, but there's more to him than just that. And, and our wonderful Armstrong can look at him and relate to him in a certain way. At the end of this section of the story, we're about to do a section break, but the end of the section, uh, Camille looks at Croco shit and immediately thinks that this is someone he couldn't empathize with. Even if he wanted to, she was too far gone. Um, the unspoken implication here by comparing that to what he just did with Chris, which is empathize with him is that Chris is in fact, not too far gone that there is hope for him yet a chance and an opportunity to be good even though he doesn't always do good and i think that's so important that that is what his character is doing here that is that is the role of his character in these moments to look at these people and be able to say you you still have hope here's an example of someone who has gone too far and that's kind of what the rest of this chapter is is kind of exploring that concept with crack of shit and i think the consequences of that as it pertains to Chris are very interesting because crock of shit. I mean, Chris isn't literally a changer, but he's functionally a changer. Right. And crock of shit is someone who has, who started out as probably a fairly bad person, but at least had enough good in her that she was a, I don't know, she could function as a protectorate soldier and she went after bad guys. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then she changed, you know, using her power as sort of a vector into this, creature who is now just kind of a self-affirming monster and that and i guess the idea being like this is what chris is in danger of doing to himself yeah not not just chris though i think we're gonna i'm gonna draw some i'm gonna draw some crock of shit lines to a lot of characters okay awesome so we skip forward a bit uh after chris has had to run off to deal with victoria's sneaky adventure yosef tries to pry out an answer as to what MS protocol refers to mm-hmm. and brazenly uses croc to pin down um, Armstrong when he is evasive. Yeah. And, and what I love about this is it really serves to immediately establish croc of shit as the central antagonist of this chapter. Right. Because like there's part of me that was still not 100 percent sure about the idea that they were going to use someone to murder Armstrong and make it look like Breakthrough did it. Like it was just kind of this weird thing that I wasn't hundred percent sure of. And it's like, who's it going to be? Is it, is it really going to be this character? It's really going to be one of the pair of humans that's going to do it. Um, but regardless of, of if that ended up being true, which of course it did, this moment lays out the conflict of the chapter Armstrong, the empathetic, relentless optimist against a woman that's working against him that he cannot empathize with. Right. It's, it's great tension. He can't tell the truth, but he can't outright lie either. Um, which gets us into some like packed esque kind of fun dialogue challenges as he talks his way through this scenario. Yeah. That, that's kind of an inevitable comparison. Although I will say that he himself draws the distinction of like, th- there were parahuman lie detectors who focused on the letter of the law and ones that focus on the spirit and, and, um, croc can tell when he is twisting his words so in in pact you're totally allowed to twist your words yeah um (laughs) right right as as, you know so it is more about the letter of the law so so it's it's actually distinct there and and it makes her actually more dangerous yeah like like he says yeah there's also there is an interesting beat here that i don't know if the book does a lot with but it lets armstrong know that there might be some master stranger shit going on here Mm -hmm. uh which i think only serves to like inflame the tension of the scene because he doesn't know what or where from but we do, right? Like, I, I don't, 
we know that this is kind of like, oh, it's just Victoria worried. So I think it increases the tension for him. But I don't think we, the audience, really feel that because we know what it means. And and yeah. the book doesn't really do a lot with it. It's just like a casual like, oh, right now I'm paranoid, too, because I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And it says specifically that his paranoia is sort of reserved for the people who are closer to him because yeah. like you're already distrustful of the people who you thought about as your enemies. Mm -hmm. It's now your friends that you can't trust, which is what makes it insidious. Yeah. So um, I like this line holding true to what he believed and knew the capes were good. They wanted a better world, whether for themselves or for everyone, but they often struggled to find the way there. I just think this is a fascinating statement and like it, it, it borders on being simplistic. Just the sentence, the capes were good. It's like, well, clearly there's some shitty capes, but it's an interesting way of framing it to say like, well, even shitty capes probably want to make the world better for themselves. Yeah. You just have to find the right place to stand and you can see them as being working towards something positive. And then maybe if you're, if you've got yourself into that position, then you can find a way to get them onto you know, onto the team aligned with everyone else. Like that's like, like who, who looks at damsel of, of distress circa Boston games and thinks she's good. She's working <laughs> for the good. Like, no, no, but, but he was able to put himself in that position where he can see a way, a path for her from where she is. Yeah. Well, th to where she is now, frankly. Yeah. I mean, if, if you would have looked at and I know like, yeah, it's a clone, blah, 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 like yeah, c c complex stuff. But yeah, I, I agree. If you looked at Damsel and said, no, you're bad. Um, we're not going to give you any opportunities anymore. You're bad. Um, we wouldn't have Ashley now. Yeah. Right. We wouldn't have this this wonderful ascended person. And I think that that is so that is so it's so wonderful. And and again, I think we're, we're at the end of our arc here and what we're doing at the end of our arc is kind of wrapping up things and bringing, bringing things from earlier in the arc together. And I look at Armstrong and I look at Gary Nieves and they're almost opposites of each other. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Gary believes inherently that capes are nothing but bad. And, and Camille Armstrong here believes that capes are good. They are good. N Nieves beliefs in this arc are reinforced by teacher and challenged by breakthrough who are the best example of this good people who sometimes don't do good things idea. Armstrong's beliefs are in this chapter kind of directly challenged by Crocker shit, right? Because Crocker shit is this person that like her, her, her basic argument is that like, no, like this is who I am. I like being this person. And like a terrible, a terribly irredeemable person is a direct challenge to his capes are good thing. I, I think the end of the chapter shows that he is right. Right. That that um, while while you have this character of Cracker shit who has gone too far, um, the fact that there is a good person in there or what there was a good person in there matters. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he was trying to make some kind of contact with that good person that was in there the whole yeah. time. He never really gave up on that, I don't think. Yeah. Until the very end. Yeah. So as he's in there with Yosef and the, you know, some of the capes, Kenzie's warning reaches him. She cleverly transforms the warning into a reminder to take his nitroglycerin. Mm -hmm. uh, this bit, which where he's just wildly freestyling, trying to escape from this impossible situation, I think is some of the tensest and the best stuff in the chapter, if not the arc. Um, he's like interrupting. He's like geeking out ostentatiously. <laughs> None of it works. You kind of you kind of know it won't because yeah. He, like it's too late. Like like a warning was never was was never going to get him out of this situation. He's he's already in their in their pocket basically. Um, and Crocker shit is so terrifying here because she's not just going to crush him. She's also the one who knows he's lying and knows that he's terrified. She's basically a horror movie monster. She's relishing it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You're you're absolutely right that the writing here is really fantastic. Like the tension building here is great. I really love the moment with the phone where like. They're like, let me see that. And you're like, oh, shit. And then he's thinking to himself, would they remember? Would they remember that that I have a heart condition? <laughs> uh -huh. Would they remember this? And then, yes, of course. Yay. Um, and then if, and then it changes to a panic button. And he, so he's got his panic button. He can hit it any time, but he like doesn't know when the right time to hit it would be. It's wonderfully tense. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Right. Because he's like, I don't I don't see a way out of this. Right. So should I just push the panic button now? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. It's. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So he's led away by her to be killed by her, 
And he rapidly runs through, through this analysis, recalling everything he knows about Crocus shit and also kind of rehashing her story for us. Yeah. And kind of highlighting the fact that it's interesting that we learned a bit of information about her in the previous chapter. It was preparing us for this. Yeah. So, so that it, we don't need quite as much information to be relayed now. And then she starts to gradually change, becoming more monstrous, larger, uglier, stronger. He tries to talk her down, but she's almost the opposite of everything that's represented by Breakthrough. She's just dived straight into this vortex of all the ugliness of the world, and she's absorbed it with full intention and awareness. That's well said. Beautiful. Thank you. And then, you know, she even while she's transforming, though, she does oblige him by telling her the story of her origin as she continues to change into like a braided mass of flesh, which is described. The overall form was more like something between a naked mole rat and a bat without wings with skin like callus, only resembling scale when it was pebbly and not a sheet of the stuff. The tattoos stood out and multiplied as the skin did, casting whole areas of her in blue green. There was more to it, he saw. Folds and flaps parted as she breathed or moved one way or the other. And he saw hidden teeth or limbs buried within. <laughs> Fucking shards, man. <laughs> Fucking shards. Um, there is this nice beat where he says nothing at all like a crocodile, which uh-huh. is like exactly what Ashley said last chapter. And again, that's I think that echo there, maybe not intentionally, but the fact that Ashley, this is a, a man that's so important in Ashley's life. And she kind of echoed his thought process here, like mm-hmm. shows them aligned in certain ways. Um, yeah, which I just really like. It's right, I mean, very subtly done, but I like it. It's almost a darkly comic thing for him to be thinking right now, where he's right. about to be killed, and he's like, "Her name doesn't fit." Yeah, I want to talk about this character so much, Matt. Let's uh, do it's it. like I think what Wild Bill managed to do in basically two chapters is create a character that is the perfect representation of so much in the story. Like Krakow shit is everything that Gary Nieves. Yosef and most of Shin believes capes are right a true monster but then what the story does is show that she wasn't born this way once upon a time Krakashit was Fidelis a hero she did a bad thing in the military and then wanted to make up for it and became a hero to do so but slowly the ugliness ugliness of the world and her guilt over the event both literally and figuratively warped her into this monster and I want to talk about that name a bit, right? Like Wildbo uses names in multiple ways and has fun with them. And so I think we're going to t- kind of do like an out of section name game here. But I think it's important to talk about this here because her name is Fidelis, of course, which comes from Semper Fidelis or always faithful in Latin. Semper Fi being like the Marine slogan, right? So mm-hmm. this is a name that came that was created out of her uh, origin of being a Marine and also, you know, the basic meaning of Fidelis, which is like faithful, loyal, true, you know, true. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's a fun double name there, but I just like, we have this name, this name Fidelis and it has so much meaning to it. So much meaning to like, of, of kind of pride in her background as a Marine. Um, it, it, it's plays well off her power. And then she changes her name to croc. Oh shit. Um, and yeah, you could say, oh, this is a clever playoff of crocodile because that's what you kind of look like now, but she doesn't right? like it is, it is the name itself is a rejection of the previous name, right? It's, it's a fun, it's again, a fun playoff of the idea that she senses lies. Like it's, we, I think we pointed that out the first time we saw her, but it is, it is an internal rejection of that Fidelis character. And, and it literally means container right a crock is like a like a pot right yeah so like uh sh- and she is so basically something that contains all of the shit of the world yeah she absorbs it into herself and contains it so in a sense she is a crock of shit um <laughs> Right. Like it's it's very it's a, this is one of the more multi-layered names which is funny because when I first saw the name I was like this is a joke name yeah. but no it's 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 like multifaceted and and fantastic yeah um and of course, there's the extra layer to Croc, which is that it's like crocodile. Which maybe at one point she looked like a crocodile, but not yeah, anymore. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I, the the whole Fidelis Croca shit thing, I, I think, is is great, and um, it's one of these moments where if you don't slow down to read into it, it's, you're you're not gonna get it. Yeah, so I'm glad we glad we do. I, I yeah, that's why I love this book. Yep. Um. Cool. So. Armstrong indicates yeah, that skip, Crocs skip this whole part. We skipped this whole part. Skip this skipped, whole part. Do we have a script? Um, <laughs> so Camille had, so the text says Camille had figured her out, if only to a small degree. 
that she had committed a wrong once and somewhere along the line because she hadn't dealt with it. It had festered. And that's one of those lines where I'm like, spot on. Like, yeah. like, and you wouldn't even realize how powerful it was if you hadn't read the whole story that preceded it, right? But it's such a culminating statement. Yeah. And uh, it is moments like this that I remember exactly why I truly love this book. Because mm-hmm. we're taking this one character, this one character that we really didn't even know anything about until a chapter ago. And now we're drawing lines to everyone. Like we've already made that comparison to Chris. I think it's a wonderful apt comparison. We're kind of going to compare him, her directly to Sveta by the end of this novel. Um, Krakashit's failure is Sveta's moment of triumph, right? And here in this moment, I think there's a line that can be drawn here to Amy, right? This is exactly what Amy has done and is doing. She committed a wrong and she's not dealing with it. She thinks she is. She thinks going to the birdcage was dealing with it. It wasn't. Fidelis went to the birdcage too. She thinks going to Shin and trying to good, do good here is dealing with it. It's not. Fidelis came to Shin too, right? Like, there are lines here between these characters. Fidelis became Krako shit when she decided that it was so much easier just to not bother, that it was too hard, that the world was too ugly, that it was too hard, and, and she was consuming or or being consumed by all of it and it just became easier and better to just embrace it to become that monster and so the question now is is panacea has panacea become the red queen enough for the same to happen i don't know i don't know right dot says she's about halfway there right a couple Uh chapters ago that's what dot said you're about halfway there to the red queen so I mean, halfway there is not fully there yet. We, we look at Krakashit as this character who is beyond hope, beyond redemption. She has gone too far. She is too much of that monster. And we look at all these characters around them in a way that. In a way that makes the question of, yeah, is is there hope for these characters still? And I don't know. I don't know. Um but I think I think the fact that we can use this one character to draw those lines is really fantastic. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's just a great a great contrast. This this whole idea that we have of like I think it's a very popular idea in in real you know culture to say like just put the past behind you. If something bad has happened, just try to forget about it. Just put it behind you. Put the the, the people the people who have wronged you, the events that you regret, just put it behind you. You know that's that's the best you can do and this idea that these things fester first of all i think it's it's one of the things the book is communicating thematically is like yeah they, that is how it works that is realistic like you 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 know you you put your brother away in the pocket dimension that doesn't solve your problem it just festers and and, and manifests in all kinds of horrible ways and it makes your problem much worse every character we have in this story who pushes away their problems or runs from them um, and doesn't face them and deal with them even though it's hard to deal with him, it's not a great, happy life to face and deal with your problems. It's so much worse to run away from them, yeah. to let them fester. And it, it's she. She is almost the most literal manifestation of that, where her body has has her body itself has festered with with the failure to deal with her own issues. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. It's great. So Armstrong indicates that Croc's admission of the plan to kill him was all recorded. And is being live transmitted to someone else. Croc gets pissed and storms over to where Breakthrough has been gathered. Then storms away when she realizes she won't be able to expose their meddling. Just before Croc can eat him, Sveta comes to the rescue, slipping through the drains, fighting the monster in close quarters, and pulling Camille out of danger. Ah, uh, this is such a wonderful moment. <laughs> I yeah. love this so much. Sveta swooping in, and I love that even at the end here like Armstrong has not quite given up even for a person he says at the beginning is too far gone he says stop Fidelis you're better than this and then the text is but she wasn't <laughs> and and the thing like we've been talking about this idea of our capes good our capes bad um this general idea and and the, this idea of recovery and redemption and 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 forgiveness and and change and improving yourself there are people in this world that are not going to do it, right? There are people in this world that cannot be saved because they have chosen not to save themselves. Um, And and so just just because you are this person who has this relentless optimism, just because you are this person that looks at capes and says the statement, capes are good. All of them. Like he didn't say some capes are good. He said capes are good. 
just because you make that 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 declarative statement does not mean that suddenly um, you can't find yourself in a situation where, well, I'm sorry, this one just was too far gone. And yeah. and it's not it's not um, it's not that that he that Fidelis that Crockett was never capable of change, right? Like that that we're, we're not. I don't think we're saying from the beginning, from the very beginning of of Fidelis's time, from the moment of her mistake, there was no opportunity for someone to come in and help her and change her and 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 like help her become the person that was better than what she's become right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. but sometimes you are too far gone. Right. I, I feel like it would be delusional of him at this point to to insist that she is still good right right like and, it's just it's kind of a sanity check if anything yeah and he's not that type of person yeah and yeah, and yeah. i mean so i i love this i love that like i i believe i do believe that people are good mm-hmm. i i do believe that and that does not mean that people are not capable of badness right uh, but I, I love this idea that if if we believe in them, if we support them, if we take people like Ashley, if we take people like Sveta, we can help these people. If if we if we choose to see the good in them while there's still time, we can create them in some of the most wonderful, powerful, uh, shining examples of goodness in the world. And yeah, I mean, I love that. I, I might elaborate on his statement like people are good if you give them the chance to be good. Yeah, yeah. But, you know young damsel never really had the chance she, she she had every every disadvantage right it wasn't until someone like him gave her the chance to be good that she yeah. and, and then when when he did look look where she is now yeah yeah i like, mean and, and the question i think the question then becomes at what point is it too late right mm-hmm. like like obviously the at, at the crock of ship point is is when it's too late but are any of our characters there? And that's, I don't know the answer to that. Well, like, I, I, is Amy, I, is Amy at that point yet? I don't know. I, I don't think know. Kinsey, I think Kinsey drew this line for us earlier in the arc where she said that the, the most, the most pathetic thing is a person who refuses to change. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, it's all about the decision, right? Cro- yeah. the, the problem isn't that there was some, something flawed in, in crock of shit that made her irredeemable. It's that she chose this. Yeah. And Chris is in the process of choosing this. And the question is, like with Chris, with Amy, have they crossed that line where they've chosen it so consistently that there is no path out of that? Yeah. And yeah. Maybe yes with Amy. Maybe no with Chris. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't yeah. Know. I mean, that, it's, yeah. A, it's a good question. And one I think that the book is going to continue to explore for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the guards take Armstrong to Sveta's cell where he finds her having slipped back through the grate, uh, glowing with pride of being a hero and having saved him and the text says maybe the difference between himself and miss natalie madison was that she hadn't had the chance to see this light yet only the darkness so dusty in here scott i know it's wonderful it's such a great end to a fantastic arc um like and and this this arc really challenged you a lot of times right like we looked at this book as the story of the world has ended. People are trying to recover here. It's a second chance for, for humanity. It's a second chance for capes, uh, a second opportunity for all these characters. And over the course of the last 13 arcs, we've seen people fail and struggle and we've seen some people get better, but we've seen the world get worse. And then we get into this chapter where Victoria is confronted with uh, her worst nightmare. And Amy is just as bad as she thought she was. Um, and, and you're just kind of beaten down, right? You're just kind of like, oh my God, like maybe, maybe things aren't going to get better. Maybe things are like, maybe things are just going to get worse. And I think they're, they're probably going to get a little worse before the, the, the story's over. But the end of this arc, the end of one of the most challenging emotional arcs for me to read in this entire book, we have this statement of hope. We have this statement of look what happens when you believe in people. Look what happens when you support people. Look what happens when um, you, you choose to see the shining light, not just the darkness. Right. Because like we don't know that the arc is over. We don't know that they get out of this situation. All right. But I, I, I suspect that they do. 
Yeah, I think um, the, I think the, the the chapter kind of makes it seem like it's over. I think yeah. like his statement is like whatever whatever plan Shin had to use their uh, controlled capes to to trick the uncontrolled capes into violence had failed. failed. Like yeah. so, like I think that's pretty definitive. Yeah. And and so you can read that as they won breakthrough one. The yeah, heroes they did they, they they won. They went through hell. They were tortured. Victoria was put through as you said earlier her her worst nightmare her literal worst nightmare but they won Mm -hmm. they 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 held the line they didn't compromise except for maybe some butt stabbing and (laughs) and they and they won and that's that's that like it puts a whole different twist like 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 you were saying this this the story would feel very different if they had failed right yeah if they had been put through all that and they failed um so yeah it's that's just it just feels great it's great well i mean look the arc was called breaking, right? Yeah. Did did breakthrough break? I don't. I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so either. I, I think, I think they survived this. Mm-hmm. They survived the cracking. And and yes, look, we got a whole conflict with teacher coming up. We thought this was going to be the teacher fight arc, wasn't at all. Um, that's coming up. It's not going to be good. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard, and our characters are going to suffer, and some of them might backslide, but. As everything was crumbling around them, as everything was cracking and threatening to break, breakthrough st- stood strong with each other. And once again, this is like the idea of community, the idea of finding strength in each other, and, and the idea of change through community um, is this this unifying theme of this entire story. So once again, despite everything that our characters have gone through, they're they're not broken yet. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe it's a positive kind of breaking, like they're breaking out of their prison egg shell. Yeah. Breaking out of prison. Breaking out of prison. Yeah. No, they are basically. Yeah. So the chapter kind of somewhat ends with this somewhat foreboding note of Sveta didn't quite cover up the three wounds she'd sustained all in a funny shape. Now, are we are we to assume that she got new wounds fighting Croc, or are these the wounds that she had from earlier? My my read on it was she got a couple new wounds. She okay. she definitely had one wound from the stabbing in the yeah. riots. I think she got a little more wounds from Croc. And so it's just like we just talked like heartwarmingly about positive and, and hope. And, and but when we get this little tiny beat here at the end of the story um, that once again, her wounds behave in a way that's slightly different. And, and this could escalate into a problem for her down the road. Yeah. Something for us to be aware of. Tech, the text definitely draws our attention to it enough times, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. All right, Scott, that was these two chapters and maybe the end of the arc. Cool. All right, we so did let's, it. Let's do some community discussion question thingies. All right. Their official name is, is that. that. <laughs> so the previous discussion question was um, referencing the discussion from last episode when Wild Bill uses dot as a perfect third party to convey some information about Amy that Victoria's perspective alone could not convey, select your favorite instance in Parahumans in which differing perspectives have revealed important character information. Discuss the way in which Wildbow achieved his goal with these characters. First, we have from Nugget Blaster 69 <laughs> Someday I'll not laugh at that. Since not we today. view most things from Taylor's perspective in Worm, we tend to think that she's not really that bad of a person despite bearing the title of villain. So we typically see her as only ruthless when she needs to be, because that's how Taylor views herself. But when Glenn Chambers shows her the video of herself during the fight, she sees that her actions in combat are a lot more disturbing than she realized. So through using Glenn and the video's perspective, Wild Bill was able to illustrate that Skitter was much more terrifying than Taylor or the reader had realized. Yeah, great, great answer. That's what I was thinking about when I asked the question, so... Um, we have Calinero who basically echoes that same thought, elaborates on it a little bit, but, uh, first Calinero outlines a few examples, bone saws interlude, completely reshaping our understanding of Riley, seeing Taylor from Theo's perspective, post Aster murder, even seeing Brian's thoughts on Taylor in a remote romantic sense in his interlude. But then, uh, then Calinero dives deep into, uh, the Taylor conversation with Glenn echoing nugget blasters idea. Um, (laughs) Calinero says Skitter looks like a villain. 
not just a villain, a scary one who stings and maims regular people who are powerless to stop her and strides effortlessly through the PRT's halls of power. She casts a dark, scary, and powerful image. She had her own reasons for attacking the PRT, reasons we saw and understood at the time, but that doesn't change what you were doing and how it looks. Taylor watches the tape, realizes for the first time how much she has truly become a supervillain, and is even confronted with the fact that she picked up some of those techniques without realizing it. That's how deep into this she is. Glenn then rubs salt in the wound with a final remark of the tape. If you told me that girl was in the Slaughterhouse Nine, I would believe you. This is one of the most powerful things that he can say to her, and I think he knows it. Not only is Taylor a survival of conflicts with the Nine, knowing exactly how dangerous they are, but the entire reason she has decided to become a ward in the first place is to try to stop the Nine from ending the world. They are her enemy, the one she decided to focus on entirely. Realizing that, from the outside, there's not nearly as much distinguishing her from them is a wake-up call. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think, I think the, the moment with the tape and Glenn's commentary on it is, is one of the moments where even if you are doing the binge thing where you don't really pay attention to the subtext and, and the complicated stuff while I was doing with this character, mm-hmm. that's one moment where you're forced to say, Oh shit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's really, it's, it's a really great moment. I, I yeah. completely agree. And yeah, if I had been reading this like not as slowly and deliberately, I think that would have been, a, I mean, it was still an oh shit moment for me yeah. because e- even, even when I still like was analyzing the book and kind of saw through some of Taylor's bullshit, I think it's still really shocking to see just how scary and cold and, mm-hmm. and inhuman she looks in that, in that tape. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're in her head seeing it. So it's doubly effective. Right. Yeah. Cause she's realizing it as you are. Yeah. Yeah. Perditorian says, I always enjoyed when the Undersiders gave their own insights into each other. Notable examples include Brian explaining how Alec ask, acts when he's upset, the early Lisa Taylor conversation about Rachel's psychology, and Brian noting when Lisa is going down a rabbit hole with her deductions. In Ward, we've, we've also gotten Foyle's description of Tattletale as a manipulator. I've also noticed in most cases, the, pers- uh, the, the perspective the third party is providing isn't completely new information. Rather, it serves to recontextualize what the protagonist has already observed without fully understanding. Alex's cutting humor was him being upset. Tattletale has been a wreck for 11 arcs because running a city isn't what she's good at. These insights are rooted in the text. The third party is just giving us, and the protagonist, a new lens through which to view the character. Yeah, I I think that's fantastic, actually, because there's almost never a case where where you're, you're, you're... given new information this way right it's more like just oh like brian's better at understanding people in a specific way or or you know foil actually actually knows lisa on a personal level and but whereas whereas victoria doesn't know her and kind of hates her and so it makes sense that there'd be a totally different spin on things you yeah. know it, it, it's all it's all very organic and I, it's a great technique it's, it really is yeah i mean th- that fits perfectly into the taylor glenn situation too right we're not learning any new information about taylor there's mm-hmm. no there's no new big reveal here in the tape that glenn shows her it's just just a different lens on the same thing and showing how 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 much that reveals about that character yeah totally yeah. march was may picks Brutus. Brutus's interlude. Uh, they say that I, fir- I thought that Brutus's interlude was first just Wild Bo playing around, flexing his writing muscles. That's absolutely what it was, partially for <laughs> sure. Uh, I didn't know it would have serious plot relevance, setting up the Undersiders versus Empire 88 so their anti-ABB team-ups were awkward and the Undersiders would make sense as the ones leaking everyone's identities. Basically, it helped set up the world of Brockton Bay as being more complex and detailed and not just bullied girl finds new friends are slightly villainous, but villain is just a team name. Um, I like that a lot. I, I, the, I thought about the Brutus interlude as like a great clue into um, into Rachel a little bit um, mm-hmm. using using the perspective of Brutus as a clue into Rachel. Yeah. Well, yeah, because she's been just terrible up until this point. And then we see her being just devastated by seeing these dogs in the, in the state that they're in. And it yeah. immediately makes you, you know, have some sympathy for her. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Beard of Valor says Byron's opinion of Tristan and Tristan's opinion of Tristan. Tristan sees himself as working smarter in the quest of finding friends and acceptance in high school. Byron sees Tristan as someone who doesn't seem to even want a milkshake unless he can be drinking Byron. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) He doesn't decide to color his hair until Byron does it. And then he goes further and people react more positively. He doesn't search for his own friend group as much as find and tug on every tie to Byron. 
follow it to the other party, and build the new tie a little stronger to Tristan. At every turn, Tristan's, Tristan's actions are based on Byron's in a sort of competition for resources that are not actually limited, as if he can only be winning if Byron is losing. But Tristan's perception seems to be that he and Byron interact with a lot of the same people, but Tristan does it a little better, and that's all it is. If that were all it was, he wouldn't make the comparisons he does to Byron, and he wouldn't be so reactionary in his one-upsmanship. He would make more slash better friends and more bold slash well-received fashion choices, but not at the expense of Byron's ties to his own friends, or by coloring his hair when Byron colored his. It would take a unique and personal form of expression. It would be with friends who share his interests, whether or not they are friends of Byron or friends of Byron's friends. In Byron's view, Tristan is an all-consuming parasite devouring him. In Tristan's view, he's just a little stronger and tougher and sharper. In the end, an alien death parasite made it so Tristan really did subsume, sub, subsume Byron and his ties to friend, family, and even life tra trajectory and briefly sexuality. And he is also a little stronger, sharper, and tougher. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. I mean, the, these two characters, how they see each other is so important um, yeah. to, to their ongoing relationship and the struggles they've had. Um, and um, I think... I, I think I still love this central idea that even seeing through each other's eyes was not enough to understand what, what each other was like. Yeah. Right. It, it, it It's so fantastic. Cause it gives the lie to the idea that all you need is to, is to have perspective. Like now you need, you, you need, you need an extra effort of empathy, right? It's right. Not, it's right. Not just perspective. Yep. Um, and, and I like this idea that they both, not only are they, are they wrong? Like, like Tristan's probably too critical of, of Byron. Byron's too critical of Tristan. But also, Tristan's too easygoing on Tristan, and Byron's a little bit too um, easygoing on Byron. Like they, they're both wrong about each other and themselves in ways that are biased in their own favor. Yeah, like that's just you know people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just what people yeah. do. Yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, Kyrgyzstan says whenever we get an info dump from basically anyone who knew Kenzie before the events of Ward here, I think particularly of 4.4 and 5.5 where Houndstooth and Mayday respectively lay out some truth bombs about what it was like to deal with Kenzie back in the good old days. Um, and they go into a quote about uh, Kenzie's cute and how she's precocious and then messes follow. I feel like I've often been a bit cooler on Kenzie than the rest of the community. We can take it as a gift that she, given that she's a great kid, a true hero, trying her best, showing excellent progress, etc. She's also profoundly dangerous and has a history of consistently, albeit accidentally, obliterating the lives of most everyone who's gotten close to her. To the tune of dozens, it sounds like. Call me unheroic, but I wouldn't want someone like that in my own life or in the lives of people I care about. The characters in Ward are people I care about, so that's going to trigger some anxiety for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I do like, we are kind of, it is very interesting that we are kind of being told by people who have interacted with her in the past, how dangerous she can be. And all of our characters and, and us, our reaction to that is like, Hey, and I do, I mean, I do think Houndstooth and Mayday were looking at her in the worst possible light, right? Like, like taking the bad stuff she's done and, and exemplifying that to the expense of everything else. But also, yeah, she definitely did this stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, th there's definitely, like, when you're reading fiction and you are never going to encounter Kenzie Martin, then it's very easy to say that they're being meanie heads. Um, <laughs> but but I think in real life, like, if you, if you know that somebody is kind of a, a disaster of a human being, you're going to be tempted to steer clear of them because maybe they deserve your empathy and compassion, but... You can do that from afar, can't you? Yeah, I, I love tell yourself. I love reading about Kenzie. I love <laughs> I love seeing Kenzie, and I love being like Kenzie. You're doing awesome. I I I am with I am with uh with Kyrgyzstan that I would not I would not want to be friends with Kenzie. Uh, yeah, I think that's a bit of a challenge to 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 consider. Like, hey, like, do you owe it to someone who is actually that quote unquote dangerous um, to give them a chance? You know? Yeah. So, and like, yeah. we, I mean, we talk about heroes so much in the story. I think the people who see people like that and then are like, yes, I want to, I want to interact with you. I want to be friends with you because I believe I can help you. I believe I can help you through the things you suffer with. I think those people are heroes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Obviously sure, not me. Too. Obviously not. But yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last answer from Newt Noodles. They talk about Taylor's interactions with Dinah after the death of Coyle. 
uh, where and how they shed a different light on Taylor's decisions. Much like the PRT footage that Glenn showed her, we're given an outside perspective on Taylor through Dinah's visions and percentages. We see Taylor confronted with her actions before she has a chance to rationalize them. Taylor singles out, sorry, Dinah singles out Taylor as a source of conflict, death, and trouble a few times. After receiving tons of unsettling information from Dinah's answers, such as being told that she will play a pivotal part in the end of the world, being questioned on whether she would actually murder a large swath of the country, and being told that she would be one, the one uh, causing trouble, um, the majority of the trouble at the, at the clinic, the most troubling answer was to question was to a question that, that was never asked aloud. After being asked many of the same questions that Coyle had asked her and running close to her limit in terms of her own strength, we hear the answer to the question Dinah has been saving for herself. And Dinah's power is not something she can rationalize away. Dinah can see numerous realities where Taylor does what she claimed she was fighting against. Over 40% of them. We, we see Taylor reflect and stop mid-escalation. <laughs> We, we then see her do something <laughs> after this that she rarely does. She sends Dinah home, giving up the greater good to perform the lesser good. After Taylor pr promises to take Dinah home, within 24 hours, we get the final line of the chapter. A full minute passed before she responded with a murmured, thank you. <laughs> you can almost feel the numbers churning in Dinah's head as she waits for them to change, imagining countless alternate Taylors speaking up and saying variations of, after we know it's safe until the full minute passes we see a core pillar of, of taylor's character to this point threatened so soon after she has just killed her first person diana's unique perspective with an eye on the future and the consequences of the decisions being made by herself and around her make for such an interesting lens she knows she has she knows that she has to fully experience her own uh, withdrawal withdrawal or risk relapse at a much higher rate and in some degree we are left wondering how much of what she says to Taylor is what she needs to say to be able to go home. It's fitting that the person with the power to give answers leaves us asking a lot of questions. That was That's a really great good. answer. I read the whole thing because I thought it was all great. Yeah. Um, it, it, so I, I, this is not what I thought of when I thought of the question, but I, I, I really like this idea. Like I remember talking about this point and, and like Taylor having to deal with this concept of like Dinah being like, Hey, um, please, please bring me home. And she's like, and she had those moments of like, well, actually having this person would really make things easier to right. do. Like there's these brief moments of part where she considers it. And like through Dinah's, like the way Dinah asks the questions and the way Dinah responds to this thing, it's not only that we see a new perspective on Taylor. I think she does see a little bit of herself at least. And I think that is kind of maybe what pushes her to, to go with the, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 do the the lesser good, the lesser right. good thing, which is stop let the kidnapped child return to her house. Yeah. Is the lesser good option. I I love that. You know, and that's it's funny cuz that's one of those moments in the story that I really passed over the first time. This this idea that Taylor was really going to keep Dinah. I was like, "No, no, she's the good, she's the hero. <laughs> Taylor's the hero. She would never have really kept Dinah. She totally would have kept Dinah if Dinah hadn't weaseled her way out of it then that's it's undeniable when you when you go back to it but, but matt it's for the greater good because dinah the, could have helped them save the world the greater good <laughs> all right scott let's get to the new discussion question yeah so we went a little bit different with this one because like we said it's going to be two weeks until um we're going to be discussing y'all's answers to the question so like by the time we get to it the book will have moved on pretty substantially from these chapters and maybe be doing something else or exploring different ideas. So we didn't want to do anything super specific to these two chapters, but kind of specific. Yeah, it, it can, it can definitely relate to these two chapters. Um, but it's more meant to just be kind of a parahumans question. And the yeah. question is talk about how parahumans has changed your perspective on things. Yeah. Yes, things being the most open-ended possible word. Things, yeah. And and get as personal or as not personal as you want in this question. Um, feel free to share as much as you want or or as little as you want. Um, right. That's It's a very open-ended question for a reason. Um, do with it what you will. I, yeah. I have an answer to this question for sure. Awesome. Well, that's all we've got for you this week on We've Got Ward. You guys are all part of this show, so feel free to provide us with advice questions or thoughts on this week's reading you can reach out to us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or over on our twitter account at gotwormpod 
My personal Twitter is at ScottDaily85, and Matt's is at Mordinamail. Um, not going to be doing any live reads next week, obviously, because I'll be out of the country. No, no, I'll be out of the continent. Stop it, Scott. I'll be in Hawaii. It's going to be great. I'm not yeah. going to be reading Ward in Hawaii. I'm sorry. Yeah, but we'll miss them. <laughs> Uh, if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Ward, we recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. And of course, you can find this and all the shows we do over at our website, doofmedia.com. That's where you will find Deep Impact, which I guess just hit like a big chapter because like everyone in the Discord was freaking out about it and I haven't caught up yet, so I don't know what's going on. I, but I'm not I'm not fully caught up with the podcast, but they did just hit a milestone chapter and I'm racing to catch up now because <laughs> I am so excited to get to we'll say no more. This yep. pact is great. Hey, you know what? Um, using all of that time that you're going to have by not having, we've got ward next week. Just uh, read the first few chapters of pact. Yeah. Do yourself a favor and yeah. then check out deep impact. And in the time you would be listening to, we've got war- ward next week. You can, Listen to four, four. episodes of Deep Impact. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, good point. Uh, so, yeah, if you like any of our other shows and you want to support them, consider donating to our Patreon account, patreon.com slash doofmedia. You can donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Uh, supporting us on Patreon gives you tons of great bonuses like voting in the quarterly fan art and costume contest Q&A sessions with me and Scott access to live streams of our recording sessions like this very one that we are recording at this moment and our excellent discord chat where we hang out folks hang out we talk about parahumans we talk about stuff that isn't parahumans and we it's play great. starcraft the starcraft league is starting up again yes yes if you join now there's still a chance to join the starcraft league yeah Special thanks to new Doof Warrior, Nuke Noodles, at the $20 level. Thank you so much, Nuke Noodles. We appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for that question and that donation, Nuke Noodles. We appreciate it. And yeah. we read your review like a week ago, I think. Two weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. And yeah, I'll Nuke s- Noodles. It's been a very Nuke Noodles heavy month yeah. on We've and Got I'll see Ward. You on the, I'll see you on the StarCraft battlefield, Nuke Noodles. <laughs> are, you playing, are you playing them first? Uh, no, I'm not. No. Okay. <laughs> Disappointing. I know. Anyway, also, while you're on Patreon, make sure that you donate... To Wildo's Patreon, patreon.com slash Wildo, and donate uh, to him because this is his world. We're just playing in it. Yes, and if you cannot afford to donate right now, that's absolutely okay. You can instead always help us out by sharing this podcast any, anywhere and everywhere. If you follow us on Twitter, why don't you retweet that thing? Um, if you are other places, I don't know, talk about it. I fe- like It's always fun when you open a Reddit thread and see people go like, oh, you should listen to We've Got Ward. And I was like, yeah. It is, it is fun. It's extremely yeah. gratifying. Yes, it is. Thank you guys for all you that, that do share. We really appreciate that. And there's other stuff you can do. You can head on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher and leave us a rating and a review. This week's review comes from Arbiter Julie, who gives us five stars and says, great show, great community. Matt and Scott add so much depth to Wild Bo's works, or rather, they help us see the depth that's already there, when a lot of us might otherwise miss some of the subtler themes and symbolism he uses. If you were a fan of Worm and Ward, you are doing yourself a disservice by not listening to this podcast as well. Along with that, they have one of the best fan communities. Their Discord server is active and full of great people and conversations, especially every Tuesday and Saturday when new chapters of Ward are published. Love, Julie. Thanks, Julie. We appreciate that. Um, See, guys, it's not just us saying the community is good. The community agrees that the community is good. That's right. And it is true that the community is much more active on those particular days. It is very true. Yes. Um, Yeah. Um, Yeah. So those of you out there who don't listen to We've Got Ward but are listening right now, Go check out We've Got Ward. Wait. What? Anyway, that's it we've got for this week's show. It seems like breaking might be over. So remember, we'll be taking a one-week break. We'll be back in two weeks to cover the next four-plus chapters in whatever arc we're on. So see you then. So would you say we're taking a break-ing? I'd say that we're taking a break, but um, we're going to break through that break. No, we're not. Oh. We're just, it's just going to end. It's just going to be a break. Okay. Okay.